mm. on the dot. We will go get, ahead and get started. So welcome to everyone on behalf of NCHE and project lead to our webinar on Native Nations and the US Supreme Court. We do have a lot of Florida educators with us tonight and thanks to everyone who has joined us from as far away as Japan to across the United States. So if you have not had a chance to say hello in the chat yet, please go ahead and do that and where you are from. Um, as a reminder, NCHE has a lot of webinars and they are all free of charge. So please invite your friends so they can also learn and earn professional development points. You can go ahead and register for those on our website at nchteach.org forward slash webinars. Our next webinar will be on March 8th at 7.30 Eastern with Pulitzer Prize winner Stacey Schiff. And she's going to talk about her new book, uh, The Revolutionary Samuel Adams. So we are excited for that. We have two webinars planned in April. One is with Serena Zabin and she'll be presenting on her book, The Boston Massacre, A Family Affair. And then on April 26th, we do have another webinar that's gonna focus on pedagogy. And that is on teaching immigration history with primary sources. And that is going to be with librarian and archivist, Sonia Pacheco from the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. Um, tonight, we are joined by professor of law, Gregory Oblaski from Stanford Law. He holds a PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania and also a Juris Doctorate from Penn Law. His scholarship focuses on early American legal history, especially issues related to sovereignty, territory, and property in the early American West. His publications explore a range of topics related to Indian affairs, and he's also the author of Federal Ground, Governing Property and Violence, in the first US territories. He has many other accolades, but if I talked about all of them, we would be here the entire session. So I am going to pass it over to Greg. Great, well, thanks so much, Shauna, for the uh, for the invitation. Uh, and I, I have a, a soft spot in my heart for, for uh, teachers. I actually taught fifth grade for a couple of years before transitioning to, uh, to grad school. So uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to, to be here with all of you. Um, so I'm, uh, what you're basically going to get is a extremely condensed version of the class that I teach to my students. So uh, you're saving quite a bit of money on Stanford Law School tuition. But before we get to the US Supreme Court, I wanted to start off with some, some background. So the first thing that, that to, to start with and something that I'm sure you're familiar with is that, you know, when Europeans came to North America, they encountered an extraordinary diversity of language and cultures spanning the continent that that uh, that go under this broad rubric of indigenous peoples, And so it's hard to generalize about these many different uh, communities, but it, it is striking. There are some important similarities that that are important to note before we delve into this question. Um, so governance was highly local and decentralized, often based on ideas about consensus rather than coercion grounded in sort of local villages and clans. Anglo-Americans uh, sort of often lumped these different groups together. They labeled these different communities as nations or tribes, and they used the term Indian to refer to these indigenous peoples. Um, all of these terms end up being very central to the federal law that governs relations between native peoples and the United States, uh, which is actually as federal Indian law. So. I'm going to be using these terms nation, tribe, and Indian in their technical legal meaning in today's context. I'm going to talk about native and indigenous peoples uh, outside of that context. Uh, obviously, the, the using respectful terminology is very important to I myself am non-native, uh, and it's obviously something I, I spend some time talking about with my students. So the other thing to remember before we get to the uh, the question of the Supreme Court is to remember that by the time the U.S. was created, Native peoples and Anglo-Americans had been interacting for almost two centuries. So for in the English often depicted Native peoples, as you see here, that is, as, as violent outsiders uh, waging war against European communities. Uh, but in fact, if you look at the records, oftentimes it's the, the violence is, is equally or sometimes even more frequently directed the opposite way, that is, you have uh, Anglo-American colonists 
attacking Native peoples. And I think what this reflects is a sort of legal view of Native peoples as foreign outsiders outside of, uh, outside of the English society that was being constructed uh, on, in Eastern North America. But alongside these legacies of, of violence and warfare, the other model for sort of interaction between sovereigns that is being developed during this time period is the treaty. And of course, the whole premise of a treaty is that it is in fact a contract, right, between sovereigns. That is, we don't think of just ordinary contracts as a treaty. A treaty presumes that each of the parties entering into the agreement is in fact a sovereign. Uh, and so you see sort of early of, this be, of entering treaties between uh, between English colonists and native nations. And you see the, the one of the very first of these is the Treaty of Hartford. These of course are drafted in English and recorded in English, but there are indigenous versions of treaties. Uh, the, famously, there is this Lenape wampum belt and similar wampum belts from this time period that record these interactions. So I think this is important background to have before we delve into what the uh, question of what the U.S. Supreme Court did is to remember that the the United States is building on these long-standing practices that had existed in North America even before there was a United States. Okay, so let's fast forward to 1776. You know, the U.S. declares independence, proclaims itself a nation. And one of the things that the United States has to figure out is how it will govern its relationship with native people. And so one of the first things that actually this new nation does uh, is sign treaties with native nations just had been uh, just had been the practice before. So this is actually the very first treaty that the United States enters with a native nation with the Delaware nation uh, or the Lenape nation in 1778, the first of uh, uh, I think uh, almost 500 treaties that the United States ends up ratifying with native people. But the other question then becomes sort of how will the United States interact with uh, the indigenous inhabitants that are now encompassed within the nation's ostensible borders? And here, and this is one of the things I think I try to stress to my students is that it's important to remember that actually it's not, there are actually multiple relationships that are at issue here. There's a relationship between native peoples and Anglo-American colonists, but there's also the question of uh, the relationship between the federal and state governments, which is also looms very large in this particular area. So when it comes time to draft the Articles of Confederation, which as you almost hopefully know, is the very first sort of governing document of the United States, this question of federal state relationship actually looms uh, especially large. So if you go and look at the Articles of Confederation, it has this provision that says that the federal government, the new national government, will have the sole and exclusive power of managing what was called Indian affairs, but only so long as those Native peoples were not members of any of the states and preserving the legislative right of each state. As you can imagine, this language is uh, very confusing. In fact, uh, James Madison would later condemn it as obscure and contradictory. And very quickly, you end up having fights between the federal government over the states over who gets to control these relationships and who actually gets to have, have power over entering treaties with Native peoples. And there's a lot of fighting about this. Uh, there's hilarious, I mean, hilarious in retrospect battles that happen, uh, for instance, in upstate New York, where federal and state officials are actually arresting each other for infringing on each other's authority. And so what ends up happening is when the Constitution is drafted, uh, the proponents of the Constitution argue that we need centralized authority over relations with Native people. And so you have in the Constitution, Indians are mentioned twice. Uh, they are they are excluded from uh, representation, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But they are also included within the Commerce Clause that says that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with the Indian tribes. Now, there's an open question, how much did they mean by shifting from affairs to commerce? That's, that's a, a hotly contested question. But one of the significant things that you'll see uh, 
in this Commerce Clause is what is not there. In other words, none of the provisions in favor protecting states' rights that were in the Articles of the Confederation were included within the new Commerce Clause, and James Madison puts a lot of emphasis on this. Uh, and then the other thing that the, the, the Supreme, that the Constitution does is it makes treaties the supreme law of the land that will be enforced by federal courts. And this is going to be a very important provision, uh, especially in light of all the fighting over the supremacy of federal Indian treaties that has happened under the Articles of Confederation. Now, note that I've been spending a lot of time talking about the relationship between the federal government and the states. There was a separate question about how much power did the United States have over Native peoples? And actually, the drafters of the Constitution spent much less time on that question. And if you look at the text of the Constitution, you know, nothing specifically provides what the scope of federal power, if any, was over Native peoples. The language of the Commerce Clause, by placing tribes alongside foreign nations and the states, suggests some sort of both that they were outside the boundaries of the body, body politic, which of course is also suggested by the excluding Indians not tax language, but also suggests that they have some sort of sovereign status, but is not clearly defined in the text of the constitution. Okay. So I think it's important to, to emphasize that there are sort of two fundamental questions that uh, emerge uh, out of this time period, right? What is federal power over the state in this area of governing relationships with Native peoples? And then what is federal, federal power over, over tribes? And so you see, I think, some suggestion that after the adoption of the Constitution, the federal government has exclusive authority, although that's somewhat contested. And you see the idea that, that what are known as Indian tribes or Native nations are foreign nations outside uh, the the ordinary legislative authority of the United States. And you actually see there is language to this effect adopted by many of the proponents and drafters of the U.S. Constitution. You see Secretary of War Henry Knox suggesting this. Thomas Jefferson talks about how Native peoples have full and independent sovereignty. You do, however, get to get to start to get some uh, skeptical voices later as we move into the 19th century. So. Uh, by already by 1819, John C. Calhoun is arguing that the tribes no longer should be considered to be independent nations uh, and that we should govern them directly. And so you start to see some questioning of these foundational ideas. So this is all by way of background before we actually get to the cases be that came before the U.S. Supreme Court. And one of the important things to remember is that in this early republic period, the idea of the U.S. Supreme Court as the final arbiter of constitutional questions is still very much new. It is not settled. Of course, you probably know about Marbury versus Madison, which happens in 1803, but uh, that is only one isolated case. And the idea of judicial review, the idea of the supremacy of the Supreme Court is by no means fixed. Okay. So I was trying to think, what is the best way to give you some background? What, what should I, you know, how to cover the hundreds and hundreds of cases that the U.S. Supreme Court has covered uh, grappling with the status of Native nations within the United States? And the solution that I'm going to give you is I'm going to talk about uh, three trilogies. So one is the, the most famous trilogy known as the Marshall Trilogy that happens in the 1820s and 1830s. Um, but I have come up with what I think of as two other trilogies. The other one is what I call the Plenary Power Trilogy from the 1880s and 1900s. Uh, and then the Modern Trilogy, which are three very important cases, all decided the same year, which is 1978. And so there are lots of cases that we could talk about, but I think these nine that I'm going to talk about today are what I tend to think of as the most significant and, and most important. So what I'm going to do is talk about each of these trilogies, and then I'm going to, as I at the end of each of these trilogies, I'm going to pause to take uh, a, a couple questions. So, in thinking about, well, where else do we have three sets of trilogies? Uh, of course, what what leaps to mind is Star Wars. So I'm just going to loosely analogize to these to the uh, three sets of the Star Wars trilogies. So we start with. Johnson versus McIntosh, Cherokee Nation, and Worcester versus Georgia. That's the Marshall Trilogy. Then we have what I've called the Plenary Power Trilogy, 
which consists of this case, ex parte Crowdog, Kagama, and then Lone Wolf. And then this modern trilogy consists of Santa Clara, U.S. versus Wheeler, and then Oliphant. And so we're going to go through these quickly at a pretty high level of, of generality. Uh, hopefully in the Q&A, if you have specific questions about these, we can, we can delve into them further. So let's start with the Marshall Trilogy. Uh, this is known as the Marshall Trilogy for the straightforward reason that all three of these decisions are actually written by the same man, Chief Justice John Marshall. Uh, so let's start with Johnson versus McIntosh. So Johnson versus McIntosh is actually a lawsuit between two non-native landowners. And the question is, could a non-native landowner purchase property directly from native people as opposed to from the United States? And the Supreme Court says no. And the answer as to why the um, non-native people cannot purchase land directly from uh, native nations uh, is because, according to Chief Justice Marshall, native peoples only have something that is called the right of occupancy. So this is not quite full ownership of land. One of the limitations on this idea is basically this idea that when if native peoples are going to sell their property, they can only sell their property to one purchaser, and that is the federal government of the United States. But the important one of the, the underlying question is sort of why is it that the United States gets to define what kind of property Native peoples have at all? And here, this is where Chief Justice Marshall talks about the courts of the conqueror. He says the U.S. Supreme Court is one of the courts of the conqueror. And so because it is one of the courts that have of the, the United States, it cannot question the authority and sovereignty of the United States. Uh, and he basically says, uh, although native peoples were thought to be the rightful occupants of the soil, they did not have the right to complete sovereignty as independent nations. That, that those rights were diminished by virtue of being included within the boundaries of the United States. So Johnson is, is one of the very first cases dealing with the question of what is the status of Native peoples within the United States. And the answer that the Supreme Court gives is that they are no longer fully independent and sovereign entity. Okay. So in the 40 years from the Constitution to the, the rest of the Marshall Trilogy, you have a battle between three different groups. You have the federal government, you have a, a group uh, that are known as the uh, Ekonanaksalgi, which is a Muscogee Creek word that translates as people greedily grasping after native lands. Uh, and this is the term that the, the Muscogee Creeks use to describe Georgia and many of the other southern states that are very eager to try to get their hands on, on indigenous property during this time period. And at the same time period, you have native nations, especially what becomes known as the five civilized tribes, which includes the Muscogee, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, and, uh, and actually the Seminoles, uh, who have adopted many of the aspects of Anglo-American culture. They adopt written laws, they adopt a court system, and they are strongly resistant to Georgia's efforts to try to claim property and jurisdiction over their nations. And, and this actually comes to head in Georgia. So if you look at this map of Georgia during this time period, you can actually see that the, the northwest corner of Georgia was still legally Cherokee land. And this was land that had been guaranteed to the Cherokee Nation by the federal government in a series of treaties. And the, what happens is that Georgia basically says, well, you, the Cherokee Nation, you are within our borders. And so because you are within our borders, we can pass laws for the Cherokee people in the same way that we could pass laws for anyone else who fall within our borders. That this is part of our power as a sovereign state. The Cherokee Nation strongly resists this. Uh, you have important Cherokee leaders, people like John Ridge and John Ross, who are very familiar with Anglo-American law and practice. And they, they go to the federal government and they say, we don't recognize Georgia's claim to authority over us. Uh, and they say, because the Cherokee Nation had no voice in forming the United States, it, 
it is independent of the laws of the individual states because it is independent of them. That Georgia has no claim to sovereignty over uh, the Cherokee people. And they they actually hire, they get an attorney, William Wirt, who is uh, the former attorney general of the United States. So they get a very high powered lawyer to try to challenge Georgia's assertion of jurisdiction in court. And so the first attempt they do is they bring a case called Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. And they argue that under the language of the Constitution, the U.S. Supreme Court has jurisdiction over a dispute between a state and a foreign state. And so they argue that we, the Cherokee Nation, we are a foreign state, and therefore you, the U.S. Supreme Court, have the authority to hear this dispute. So this goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and basically uh, Justice Marshall says, you, the Cherokee Nation, are not actually a foreign state, and so we do not have jurisdiction to hear this case. He says that the Cherokee Nation and other Native nations are actually not foreign nations. They are domestic dependent nations. And so this language, so nations, suggests that they are, in fact, still sovereigns. And, in, and part of the opinion recognizes the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation. But they are domestic. What does he mean by domestic? He means that they are within the boundaries of the United States, that they are not foreign nations the way that we might think of as Canada or Mexico today, um, but they are in some ways subject to the boundaries, uh, to, to US authority. And they are dependent in the sense that their sub sovereignty is somehow subordinate to that of the United States. Uh, that he doesn't fully define what that means, but he talks about how Native peoples are like a ward to a guardian, that the federal government has some sort of claim to ultimate authority over them. So the end result of Cherokee Nation is actually the, the Supreme Court basically says, we can't hear this case because we don't have jurisdiction. But the Cherokee Nation finds a way to get the case back up to the Supreme Court. And it does throw, so through uh, this, through actually a white missionary named Samuel Worcester. So, Samuel Worcester is in the Cherokee Nation trying to Christianize the Cherokee Nation. He's actually translating the Bible into Cherokee. And Georgia passes a law that says that any white person in the Cherokee Nation actually has to swear allegiance to the state of Georgia, that they are going to be subject to Georgia law. And Samuel Worcester refuses to do so as sort of a test case to say, uh, I'm going to challenge the claim that Georgia has jurisdiction here. In other words, he's arguing the Cherokee Nation is outside Georgia's jurisdiction. And this case goes up to the US Supreme Court again. And, and actually, uh, Worcester, who again is sort of acting on behalf of the Cherokee Nation, Worcester wins. Uh, this time, Chief Justice Marshall says that federal law says that the, the Indian Territory, the Cherokee Nation, is completed, completely separate, separated from that of the states, meaning that states have no authority or jurisdiction within Cherokee territory. Now, some of you may know the famous statement by, uh, or the alleged statement by President Jackson, who was very much in favor of forcing Native peoples to remove from their homelands, that Chief Justice Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. That quote is almost certainly apocryphal. But basically what Just uh, President Jackson says is, look, uh, the Supreme Court only has made this narrow decision that it applies only to the specific parties. And ultimately, Worcester accepts a pardon from the state of Georgia. And so there isn't actually anyone around to enforce the judgment. And in the absence of support from the president, uh, the Cherokee Nation is left without anyone to really enforce this, this principle of their independence. Georgia effectively invades Cherokee territory. It sends the Georgia Guard to, and it starts actually cutting up Cherokee land. And so a splinter group of the Cherokee Nation reluctantly signed the Treaty of New Echota, in which they agree to remove westward to the Indian Territory. This is strongly opposed by many others within the Cherokee Nation, but nonetheless, the U.S. government uses the principle of, uh, of this treaty or the fig leaf of this treaty to deport the Cherokee Nation westward 
by, at bayonet point in, in what has become known as the, the Trail of Tears. So that is the, the, the sort of practical aftermath of the Marshall Trilogy. But I think what is for legally the important aftermath is that the, the Supreme Court has clarified that actually the federal government does have exclusive authority to regulate relationships with Native peoples, um, but that tribes are now going to be construed as dependent nations. Now, it doesn't exactly define what it means by that, but that is some sort of claim of federal authority uh, over, over Native people. Okay. I'm going to pause there before I move to the, uh, the next, the Plenary Power Trilogy, and just see, take a couple questions to see if anyone has any questions specifically about the, the Marshall Trilogy and the cases that I've just discussed. So, Shauna, are you going to manage this, or would you like to handle this? Handle I can certainly do that. If you have any questions, go ahead and you can um, type those in the chat, or you can type them in the Q&A area. All right, I think I have waited my wait time and there are no questions at this point. I really like the Star Wars theme here. Yeah, my students get a kick out of that, the, the Star Wars theme too. I actually originally only used it for the Marshall Trilogy, but because there are three trilogies, it, it, it worked out super well. Okay, well, let me, let me turn then to the, uh, the, the Plenary Power Trilogy. So this is so we're fast forwarding now 50 years uh, to the, the late 19th century. And by this point, this is the era where many Native people by this point have been confined onto reservations that are actually overseen by federal Indian agents. And the question is, how, how much independence do Native people still have from the federal government? And this gets tested first in a case called Ex Parte Protoc. Uh, so, uh, Crow Dog is actually uh, a Lakota man, so uh, you might be familiar with the Lakota or Sioux tribe, as they are often known. Uh, this is a, a, a set of, of seven, the, of Sheti Shakoan, uh, seven council fires that sort of live in present-day South Dakota, North Dakota. And there was a, a, uh, a murder that happened on uh, a Lakota reservation uh, in which Crow Dog kills uh, another uh, another Lakota man spotted tail. And traditionally, these sorts of disputes had been resolved under indigenous law. And in fact, uh, that is what happens here in which Crow Dog's uh, family provides compensation to spotted tail's family for the crime. So there basically was an adjudication under indigenous law that resolved the, the, the crime. However, the federal Indian agents were not satisfied with this outcome. They believe that uh, Crow Dog should be liable under federal law for this crime. In other words, that the federal government should prosecute Crow Dog for uh, this alleged murder. And, and as we saw, right, as you saw with uh, Worcester versus Georgia, often criminal jurisdiction was one of the central areas that was being uh, litigated and fought over. Now, what's interesting is actually the U.S. Supreme Court says uh, that no, uh, you, the federal government, don't have the authority to prosecute Crow Dog here. Now, in, do, in reaching this conclusion, the U.S. Supreme Court employs a lot of rhetoric uh, that basically uh, we, I think, have very little trouble recognizing now as racist. That is, it basically says that subjecting Native people to federal jurisdiction would try them not by their own customs, but by the superiors of a different race, meaning that they would be then subject to, uh, to a white jury. And then Native people cannot really understand or grasp uh, the the laws the federal law and therefore should not be subject to it. But they do say, look, we're holding this as a matter of what Congress has said, 
However, if Congress wants to reach a different result, sorry, my lights go off in here if I don't move often enough. Uh, if Congress wants to reach a different result, it can it can do so. Now, I, I just want to pause for a moment here and just note that that this actually this decision reflects a phenomenon that we often see in the history of federal Indian law, which is that the the U.S. Supreme Court, which uh, it, you know has never had a Native member, is adopting very uh, uh, culturally insensitive language and views. Um, but often reaching results that we might think of as protective of native sovereignty and autonomy. And I think Crow Dog is an excellent example of this paradox, where you have the U.S. Supreme Court adopting uh, some very dismissive language about native peoples, and there's other language in the opinion that echoes this, um, but nonetheless reaching a result that actually protects native peoples from uh, federal authority. However, Congress responds almost immediately by passing what is known as the Major Crimes Act. And this law actually basically does what, what the U.S. Supreme Court in Crow Dog said hadn't happened, which is that there had not been the establishment of federal jurisdiction over Native peoples. Uh, this law says, look, if, if certain crimes are committed within what is known as Indian country on an Indian reservation, then it is going to be subject to prosecution in federal court. And it's worth noting, actually, that this is still the law to this day, that the Major Crimes Act is still federal law. This is still, if, if someone who is legally classified as an Indian commits one of these crimes against another Indian on a, within Indian country, they will be subject to federal prosecution. So then the question becomes, so there is a prosecution under this law. Uh, a, a uh, Yurok man kills another Yurok man uh, in, on a reservation in, in upstate California. And the question then is, can, is this law a valid exercise of Congress's power? Meaning, so uh, you probably know, right, that the, the idea that the Constitution means that Congress has limited and enumerated powers. And so the question is, does the federal government even have the power to pass a law for Native people saying that this, is a, that this is a crime? And what ends up happening is that uh, the U.S. Supreme Court says, in fact, that Congress does have this power. And it does so basically saying that, look, Native peoples are wards of the United States. They are dependent on the federal government both for food and for political rights. And this is a moment where the federal government had uh, basically had through its bureaucracy on within Indian reservations, was distributing annuities, was distributing rations to native peoples. And so it says because of the, the supposed weak, weakness and helplessness of native people, which uh, there was a duty of protection and therefore the power. So note that this is not directly rooted in any specific language within the U.S. Constitution. The, co the court sort of looks at but rejects the idea that this authority grows out of the Commerce Clause. This is sort of a structural concept of the idea that, of the obligations that the federal government has been has taken on with respect to Native people. So this case is widely regarded by scholars as announcing the doctrine of what is known as plenary power over Native people. What does plenary power mean? Plenary power means basically the idea that the Congress has wide-ranging and broad authority to legislate in this area without limitations on its subject matter, right? So basically anything that is broadly construed within the Indian area of what is known as Indian affairs, as they call this, and still call it to this day, uh, is within the power of the federal government to legislate. So this then leads us to a case called Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock. So uh, Lone Wolf was a, a, uh, a leader within the Kiowa Nation uh, in sort of the Great Plains, uh, sort of a, a, the border between Kansas uh, and Oklahoma. And uh, the Kiowa Nation uh, had signed in the late 19th century a treaty with the federal government that had guaranteed the Kiowa Nation land. Now, as you may know, though, in the late 19th century, the federal government comes in 
and it starts allotting native lands, meaning it starts breaking up those lands into individual parcels of uh, a range of about 160 acres per head of household, and then distributing those to individual natives, uh, and then selling off what is the excess land in, in supposedly excess land. And this is a process known as allotment. So Lone Wolf actually uh, wages a sustained campaign against allotment. And the federal government actually sends commissioners to the, uh, the reservation to try to reach an agreement in which the Kiowas will agree to allot their land. But Lone Wolf resists this, these commissioners and they don't get enough. So the treaty actually had a provision saying you have to get three quarters of the signatures of the adult men on the reservation in order for to allot native land and succeed. They don't get enough signatures. And yet Congress nonetheless goes ahead and passes this agreement into law. So Congress is breaking the treaty that it had made with the Kiowa Nation. So this is very important, right? That this is, Congress is basically saying, yeah, we know we, we promised that we would do this, um, but we are nonetheless going to pass this, this provision anyway, and we are going to allot the Kiowa's land. And so Lone Wolf, and I think, you know, note all the, the language that we just saw about how helpless and weak Native people supposedly were during this time period. Uh, I think it, there are many instances in which Native people show that they are anything but helpless and weak. And I think Lone Wolf is a great example of this. He is he is actually something of a of a of what we might think of now. We might use the term activist, right? He resists this allotment and he actually brings suit against the federal government, challenging this action, saying, "Look, we had a treaty, we had a bargain, and you are violating this this treaty." And this goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court says, well, actually, Congress can break a treaty if it wants to. Uh, it has the authority to do so. And more than that, we're not arguing that we, the Supreme Court, we are not going to second guess what Congress has done. We are going to presume that Congress has acted in perfect good faith. And we are going to defer to the legislature, meaning that we, the, the courts, we're not going to, to inquire into what Congress did. We're not going to say, was this a fair deal? We are just going to defer to Congress's broad authority in this area. So this is a very, very robust uh, vision of federal and particularly congressional authority in this area that basically says, look, you, Congress, you get to decide what you think is best for Native peoples, even when Native peoples themselves object. And we're going to assume that they are dealing in good faith. Of course, uh, it's, as you, if you look at the history of how the federal government treated Native peoples, uh, you can see that often the, the federal government acting in good faith, but the, the Supreme Court is going to basically say, we're not going to look into uh, whether we think that Native peoples are being treated fairly in this instance. So what you see is by 1903, so here we are, over a century after the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. And now we have both the idea that the, we, so we're, the federal government is, and the Supreme Court is still embracing the idea of exclusive federal authority over Indian affairs. There's part of Kagama that actually says, look, states, you don't have authority in this area. That's why the federal government has to have authority. But it's also a moment when the federal government has now said it has plenary power over tribes. It can legislate for all aspects of internal tribal authority uh, and, and self-governance if it chooses to do so. So huge, very important set of these three cases decided in the late 19th century, early 20th century. So uh, once again, Sean, I'm gonna pause there before we move to our final trilogy uh, and see if anyone has any questions about, about, uh, about those, those cases. Sure, we do have um, two questions that came in. The first one is from Richard, and it was, how does the recent Supreme Court case in Oklahoma deal with some of the issues you're talking about? Great, so uh, I think I, I, there are actually two recent Supreme Court cases from Oklahoma, McGirt and Castro Huerta. Uh, and I'm actually, I'll, I'll get into those when I get to the end, so I'll, I'll hold off on answering that question, but I'll come back to it. 
Okay, and there's one more question. It's a good question from Heather. How do these laws sit with the 500 treaties of the 1700s? And then do any of these treaties still exist today? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, uh, very important point is that the treaties remain good law. So there were 500 treaties from uh, 1789 actually going right up until 1871. So in 1871, the, the, the Congress says no more uh, no more treaties with Native people, but it also says that those treaties are still good law. So Congress can, as we see in Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock, it can uh, basically what is known as abrogate, that's the technical term, it can say we're going to violate the treaty, it has the power to do so. But until Congress has abrogated a treaty, the treaty remains binding federal law. And, and there have been recent instances of the Supreme Court upholding, at, you know, just in 2021, 2022, treaty rights from treaties that go back to the 1850s. So Native, Native nations might have treaty rights to hunt and fish off the reservation. Uh, there was a case about, about whether they could bring in fuel exempt from state taxes under a treaty. And the Supreme Court said, yes, those are still binding federal obligations as long as Congress has not abrogated them. So the very important point, thank you for asking this question. Treaties remain the law of the land unless and until Congress has extinguished them, has abrogated them, which it can do under these, doc these doctrines, but it has to have done so clearly. Uh, and, and unless Congress has acted, treaties are remain legally binding. Even if they were, you know, even if they were from 1790, even if they were from a long time ago. Any other questions? That is all I see in the chat right now. Okay. Well, if there will, we'll, uh, we'll have one more final quest Q and A period, which I will, and I'll return to the McGirt and Castro Huerta questions in a moment. So let's get to the let's get to the final trilogy uh, of these three these three cases, all decided in in 1978. So Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez grew out. Uh, this is a, a pueblo in New Mexico. And they had a provision that basically said, if you are a male member of the tribe, your children are automatically tribal members. But if you are a, a uh, woman and you marry a non-member, so in other words, if your husband uh, is not a member of the tribe, and in 1978, of course, it was there, only a husband, uh, if you marry outside the, the, the tribe, then your children are not automatically tribal citizens. And, and so Julia Martinez was one of these women who married outside of the tribe. And she said, this is discrimination on the basis of gender. Now, Congress had passed a law called the Indian Civil Rights Act. And the Indian Civil Rights Act basically says that tribes have to follow most of the provisions of the US Constitution. And so she argues that this is actually a violation of the promise of equal protection under the U.S. Constitution because it discriminates on the basis of gender. And, and what the U.S. Supreme Court says is actually, we, the U.S. Supreme Court, we don't get to decide this. That the only institution that can decide whether or not your constitutional rights have been violated is the tribal court itself. So we, the federal courts, we are not going to hear appeals from the tribal courts about these issues. So that is a very important principle that affirms the idea that Native nations are separate and autonomous and get to make their own rules. And, and uh, I think, you know, sometimes you'll hear this described as the idea that actually tribes are not bound by the U.S. Constitution. That's by and large not true. By and large, tri these tribes still have to follow all those provisions that are laid out in the Indian Civil Rights Act, that the, the institutions that decide and enforce most of those provisions are in fact the tribal courts themselves. Very, very important decision uh, that still is good law to this day. There's another case from this year called the United States versus Wheeler. So United States versus Wheeler uh, is a prosecution uh, under the Major Crimes Act uh, for an offense committed by a member of the Navajo Nation who was 
also previously prosecuted by the Navajo Nation. So tribes have criminal jurisdiction over their own members. And the federal government had jurisdiction to prosecute here. And you might be saying, well, wait a second. The Constitution says you can't be tried twice for the same offense. Right? We That's double jeopardy. But there's an important exception to double jeopardy, and that is that you actually can be prosecuted if the, they, the prosecutions are separate sovereigns. So, so let's say you commit a crime in Florida. You can be prosecuted by both the state of Florida and by the federal government for the same crime. So that is, that is based on the dual sovereign exception. So the question is, are tribes sovereign in the same way? Does, where does the sovereignty to prosecute their own members come from? And what the US Supreme Court says is, this is actually inherent tribal sovereignty. It doesn't come from the federal government. It comes from inherent, it is something that tribes ha inherently have. And therefore, they are separate sovereigns for the purposes of this double jeopardy prosecution. So this is a really, really important legal principle that tribal sovereignty isn't, isn't federal, isn't, isn't coming from the United States, but is inherent, the, the inherent authority of a pre-constitutional sovereign that has been retained. Okay. So that's the United States versus Wheeler. So uh, let's bring, let's turn to the final case, Oliphant uh, versus Squamish Indian tribe, which takes us to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so Mark Oliphant, uh, who you see here, uh, basically uh, get, uh, gets drunk and uh, uh, assaults a, uh, a tribal police officer on the Squamish reservation. And he is prosecuted in tribal courts. So once again, just to reiterate, as we learned in the prior case, there are tribal courts, just like there are state and federal courts, and they have, uh, and they exercise both civil and criminal jurisdiction within the boundaries of the reservation. And so this tribe prosecuted uh, Mark Oliphant for committing a crime within the boundaries of the reservation, in the same way that you know, if you committed a crime within the boundaries of the state of Florida, you would be subject to Florida's jurisdiction. So the question then becomes, does the tribe actually have the authority to prosecute uh, Mr. Oliphant? And this then goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court. His attorney, Phil Malone, uh, you can see, uh, hopefully it's a little small here, but he, he likens the, the tribal authority to Hitler's uh, uh, a rather dramatic statement on his uh, attorney's part. But the argument was that Mr. Oliphant, because he was not a tribal member, didn't get to vote in tribal elections, didn't get to participate in tribal governance. Although, of course, that's true if you are, for instance, a non-citizen within the boundaries of the state of Florida. If I, as a Californian, came to Florida, I, you know, if I was passing through, I don't get to vote in the state of Florida, but nonetheless would be subject to and law, similar really, right, if I, if you are Canadian passing through Florida. So the question is, can the tribe exercise this criminal jurisdiction? And the U.S. Supreme Court said no. So the first thing it says is that tribes lack criminal jurisdiction over this category of non-Indians like Mr. Olsen. Um, but the second thing that it does is it embraces this principle known as implicit divestiture, which is that tribes are prohibited from exercising the authority that uh, are that that are expressly terminated by Congress, and that are inconsistent with their status as domestic dependent nations. And so, what what all of that kicks off is a bunch of cases in which the U.S. Supreme Court decides whether or not something is uh, inconsistent with tribal status. So, this case really this set of cases really helps spawn the current era that we're living in, in terms of the, the adjudication of tribal status, in which tribes are often, so the question is, tribes retain their inherent sovereignty, that was the, the holding of Wheeler, but that sometimes that inherent sovereignty is going to be limited by the U.S. Supreme Court because the, the justices on the court conclude that it is inconsistent with tribe status as domestic dependent nations. So, where are we? Where are we now in 2023? 
Well, someone mentioned the, the, these Oklahoma cases, so I'll just briefly talk about where things currently stand with the U.S. Supreme Court. Sadly, uh, we don't yet have a, a, a new tidy trilogy in the, quite the same way, although perhaps we, we will. We also don't have a new Star Wars trilogy either, so uh, maybe we'll get more of those <laughs> soon. Um, so uh, someone asked about the, there's a number of very important cases floating around. So. Uh, one case I think that was being mentioned, uh, McGirt versus Oklahoma. This is the 2020 case that the U.S. Supreme Court decided. In McGirt versus Oklahoma, the question was not the re the the question was a relatively technical legal question, uh, and it goes back to the question of was the treaty that the United States ha had entered with the Muscogee Nation, the Muscogee Creek Nation, when it when it was deported to Oklahoma. Had Congress abrogated that treaty? So remember that treaties remain good law. So Congress could, if it wanted to, shrink the boundaries of that reservation. It does so frequently. But the question was, had it shrunk the boundaries of that reservation? And the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, it did not, in fact, shrink the boundaries of that reservation. And what that means is that big chunks of Oklahoma were now still legally uh, Indian country, where all these special jurisdictional rules that I've been talking about, federal jurisdiction, tribal jurisdiction, still apply. So that was the holding in McGirt. And then just this last year, we got this case that was decided just this past June called Castro Huerta. And Castro Huerta basically said, well, remember how you, I mean, actually, remember how Worcester versus Georgia, which you remember is one of these Marshall Trilogy cases, Remember how you, the, the, the Supreme Court, you said that states have no authority within Indian country? Well, actually, the Supreme Court said, we're going to walk that back a little bit, and we're going to say that states do have jurisdiction over some categories of crime within this category of Indian country. So it dramatically changed one of these foundational rules of, of federal Indian law. Um, and then just this term. So if you look, you can actually see this was argued only three months ago. Uh, back in November, there's this case called Burkeen versus Holland, which is a challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act. It's a very complicated case. Uh, I, I can talk more about it. I've been involved actually with both of these cases. I wrote amicus briefs in both of these cases. Um, but but Burkeen versus Holland, Holland versus Burkeen, uh, in many ways goes back. Oops, I know I went back to the beginning there. Uh, uh, it goes to this, this, um, this question about is the federal, does the federal government have exclusive authority over Indian affairs or do states uh, have, have uh, some shared authority in this area? Uh, and, and basically when the federal government enacted the Indian Child Welfare Act, did it actually, uh, unconstitutionally in, in encroach on state authority. And that's the, the question in that case. So there's another question in that case that also about, uh, that sounds a little bit more in the, the, the Supreme Court's uh, race jurisprudence about whether uh, classification as an Indian under federal law is in fact a racial classification. Uh, that is another very important set of cases that also I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A. So, so basically what we see is that over, you know, we're now uh, almost 200 years since the Marshall Trilogy. And since then, the Supreme Court has decided really hundreds of cases involving Native nations. But they've all, many of them have come back to these foundational questions. What is federal authority in this area as against the states? We see that again and again. And then what is the federal power over tribes? And one of the things that you see when you look at this area is how much things have changed and grown and developed in, in these two centuries of arguments. Um, and then just the final note I'll, I'll add on is that, you know, as I noted, there's never been a Native Supreme Court justice. So much of this law is being made and decided without Native people's input. But uh, that doesn't mean that Native peoples are absent from this legal history. Uh, far from it, what you see is that you know, Native peoples are heavily involved. They are bringing test cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. They are uh, forcefully advocating for their, their interests. 
uh, even though the U.S. Supreme Court really in, in many ways remains what it was from the beginning, which is the court of the conqueror. This is not this is not a native tribunal. This is the court of the United States, which colonized and has subordinated native peoples for so much of this history. And so for, for many native peoples, there's an important question about whether the U.S. Supreme Court has a legitimate claim to authority over them at all and whether the Supreme Court should be deciding these questions. Um, that, I think, is a really important and longstanding issue, uh, but, uh, but one that, uh, that, you know, this court is certainly, I think, not going to uh, is not going to, to challenge its own competency and authority to decide these questions. And so, uh, you know, for Native peoples, they just face the reality that they, they have to confront these, these cases that are going to continue to come up in front of this court. So uh, I'll leave it, leave it there. Uh, hopefully I answered satisfactorily the question about the, the current uh, litigation, but I'm happy to, to answer more questions or anything else that I've talked about in the, in the five minutes that we have left. All right, thanks so much. Um, Jim asks, can the U.S. abrogate treaties with nations outside of the continental U.S.? So the answer is yes. So the the um, precedent says, you know, if the U.S. there's a case, uh, a foundational case that actually had to do with Chinese exclusion, in which from the late 19th century, in which the Supreme Court said, yes, Congress can abrogate a treaty with China or other nations if it wants to. So in that sense, it is treating Native people similarly. The difference is that, of course, uh, the U.S. also doesn't have plenary power over China or these other nations. So the, if, if the U.S. abrogates a treaty with China, China can respond by abrogating a treaty with the United States. Native people don't really have that luxury, right? If the U.S. abrogates a treaty with a Native, Native, Native nation, now that becomes binding law because the, the Native peoples are within the territory of the United States. And so Native peoples are differently situated in that regard from, uh, from foreign nations. But it is true that it is basically applying the same principle uh, that would apply to these foreign sovereigns. Oh, you're still muted, Shana. Sorry about that. I think we have time for one more question, possibly two. Um, what about state and colony treaties? What is their status? Uh, so by and large, those treaties are not legally recognized as federal law because they were not entered into by the United States. Um, they are still binding on those states in many instances, or they might be binding as a matter of state law. So for instance, um, Virginia, uh, continues to have uh, recognized a, re a treaty that was entered in the 17th century with the Native nations there. Uh, and those Native nations, I think they wanted, that's part of the promise, they, they agreed that they would bring deer to the state house every year. And so those Native communities continue to comply with the treaty uh, with the state of Virginia, and it might be binding as a matter of state law. But as a matter of federal law, the only treaties that are legally binding on the United States are those treaties that were entered into between the United States as a sovereign and the, the federal government uh, and, and native people. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, there have been some great articles shared in the chat. So hopefully you've had a chance to grab some of those links um, to do some further reading on this and um, read about how you can infuse teaching about sovereignty into your teaching. So thank you so much to everyone who was here tonight. You will receive an email tomorrow, which will count for your three hours of professional development. And thanks again for being here, everyone. And thanks to Greg for a great presentation. My pleasure. Uh, and thanks again for the invitation. Uh, it was great to, to chat a little bit and, uh, you know, Hopefully you got a small flavor. I encourage you to dig in more to this area of law just because it is so rich. Uh, I've really only begun to just scratch the surface and there is uh, so much more information to dig into. Uh, you know, uh, Debbie helpfully shared uh, a, a lot of that in the chat as well. So I really encourage you to, to, read, to, to continue to read and explore further and to pay attention to these cases because as, as we, I discussed at the end, this is 
you know, this history is hardly done and these questions are still being very much being litigated. So thanks again. Thanks everyone. Have a great night.